Test çekeceğiz bu arada. Çekeceğiz.
Welcome to Fostering Global Change, the Fulbright Experience and Water Quality Issues in Southeast Asia. This program is jointly organized by School of Electrical Engineering, UITM, Kuala Jam, and Research Industrial Linkage Community and Alumni of UITM, Kuala Jam. On behalf of the organizers, we would like to extend our special welcome to the Honorable Mr. Jason Lee, Dr. Mo Adrian Osman, the head of the School of Electrical Engineering, UITM Pulau Pinang Branch, Technologist Dr. Muhammad Suhaimi bin Sulaiman, the Program Director, UITM Pulau Pinang Branch, <laughs> Professor Dr. Melissa Lynchinski, Department of Earth, Atmosphere and Environment, Northern Illinois University, USA. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Fostering Global Change, the Fulbright Experience and Water Quality Issues in Southeast Asia. We are excited to have all of you to be here to discuss on a matter of water quality issues in Southeast Asia. The challenges involved in addressing these issues are highly relevant in the current global context as water quality issues continue to be a major concern worldwide. Before we begin, I would like to inform you that this webinar is a hybrid event, which means we have both in-person and virtual participants joining us today. Well, if you are joining us virtually, please go to our YouTube channel, UITM CPP channel, you will have the opportunity to ask questions and engage in discussions through the chat box. We'll have a Q&A session at the end of our event. And once again, thank you for being here. Without further ado, I would like to invite Associate Professor Engineer Dr. Mo Adrian Osman, the head of the School of Electrical Engineering. 
and he knew to deliver his speech. A deep round of applause. Professor Melissa, Bagaimana Dr. Josh for today Dan ke CS Dr. Muhammad Syahilul Dan uh, Program Director uh, Puan Aileen Dan uh, Respected Lecturers Dan also my beloved students Sejahtera Selain Satu and uh, uh, Salam Sejahtera to all So on behalf of the uh, School of Electrical Engineering YKM Penang Branch I would like to take this opportunity to express our heartfelt gratitude to first one to our program director, which is uh, CS Director Muhammad Syahilul, for, for their effort, uh, and also for the uh, Dr. Syahilul's effort in organizing, organizing this talk. Uh, your dedications and uh, from his team, uh, Dr. Syahilul also and his and other organizers. So we are truly uh, grateful and hopefully this opportunity will come uh, to the next session. So hopefully we will have the same event, the same session for the next uh, coming month or the next coming semester. Uh, it gives me a great pleasure to welcome you all to this talk on products color and water quality research. We are honored to have with us today, Professor Dr. Melissa Wenciski. I hope I pronounce it right. Okay, thank you. From uh, Northern Illinois University, uh, a very lovely, distinguished expert in water quality as well as a product owner. Today's talk is a testament to our commitment to providing our students and faculty with the latest insights and knowledge in the field of electrical engineering. The topic of fostering global change, the Fulbright experience and water quality issues in Southern, uh, Southeast Asia. So I would like to thank again to Prof. Melissa for taking the time to come here all the way from uh, US, I believe, uh, come down to Penang. So just to share uh, his knowledge uh, her knowledge and also her uh, expertise in this uh, water quality area. So I will hope that this talk will give lots of information to our students in terms of the, uh, what kind of opportunity they can get. Then to our lecturers in terms of what kind of collaboration that we can uh, do together with uh, Prof. Melissa. So uh, without further ado, uh, I would like to thank uh, again to thank you all. Professor and also the committee team led by CS Director Muhammad Syahilul and others for uh, uh, spending your time over here for today uh, listening to Prof. Melissa talk and I hope this will give you uh, lots of information for the week. So I pass the floor to the MC. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Associate Professor Insinyur Dr. Noor Aslan Uthman. Now, the time that we've been waiting for is here. Ladies and gentlemen, it is our pleasure to introduce our esteemed speaker for today's program. Our speaker, Professor Dr. Melissa, is a renowned expert in the field of environmental science. She is currently a member of the Department of Earth, Sphere, and Environment, Northern Illinois University, USA. Currently, she is a Fulbright U.S. Asian Scholar 2023, and she is doing her research in Cambodia and Thailand. Dr. Melissa's research interests lie in the area of environmental microbiology and chemistry, as well as contaminant hydrogeology. Her extensive knowledge and expertise in this field have made her a respected authority in the scientific community. Ladies and gentlemen, we are truly honored to have Dr. Melissa as our speaker today, and we are eagerly anticipating her insights and perspective on the water quality issues in Southeast Asia. Without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Melissa. Thank you all for coming today. We're going to get my screen and we're ready to go. for the 
wonderful uh, introduction. I thought I would introduce where I'm from, you know. Um, so I'm from Northern Illinois University. I started located in the United States in a little town called DeKalb. We were outside of Chicago. And so, you know, the central part of the United States, if you're Chicago, you're about 100 kilometers west of where I'm from. Um, my particular university was founded in 1895. It's a comprehensive research and teaching institution. We do have engineering as a whole college with inside of our university. And we have about 18,000 students who attend the University of Illinois. Um, currently, we have about uh, a little over 700 international students from um, 122 different countries. We also have a lot of students from Southeast Asia at our university. Uh, we have what's called the Center for Southeast Asian Studies. And people, uh, your professors here, have studied at NIU um, as part of Fulbright's uh, research collaboration. So if you were thinking about going to the United States, um, Northern Illinois University is a very welcoming place. You can talk to your professors about the experience um, there, and, but we would love to have more students from Malaysia come to our university. So, my particular background is what's called contaminant hydrogeology. Now, what is that? Um, I study water quality and pollution. So I look at water when it goes below the ground, and I'll talk more about that. And so part of my research has been on water quality here in Southeast Asia, which I'll talk about today. But I also work in the country of Mexico, and I look at the impact of tourism on water quality. So uh, there's an um, international component to my research. So it was mentioned that I'm a Fulbright research scholar. So what is Fulbright? Um, Fulbright is um, part of the United States program. It offers international education and cultural exchange. So research, teaching, exchanging ideas. Um, it's not just for researchers. It's also for students. It's for administrators. It's for um, faculty to be able to build and connect with all of us around the world on these very important issues. And so um, students can apply for Fulbright to go to the United States. Researchers like myself apply to do research around the world. So it is a program within the United States to be able to build international collaboration. So my area of research is really on what's called on groundwater. Well, why do I care about groundwater? Well, when we look at the water distribution on the planet, most of it is in salt in the oceans. So that makes it 97% of our water. Only 3% of our water is fresh water that we can drink or even potentially drink. So we have to be very careful because that little bit of water is what we need for agriculture, our drinking, and for our survival. When we look at that part that is the fresh water and we break it down, a lot of it is frozen right now in glaciers. And most of our fresh water comes from what's called groundwater, the water that is below our feet, water we can't even see. Um, surface water only makes up 0.3%. So all the rivers and lakes and everything make up a very, very small portion of all of our drinking water or potential fresh water on our planet. When we look at, this is the hydro, the water cycle that um, the United States Geological Survey just came out with. So when we look at the Earth's surface, we look below the ground, this is groundwater. It's all the water that's in the pores that is below the surface. It interacts with our oceans, it interacts with our agriculture, our industry, and it's where a lot of drinking water comes from for certain communities. to come in, that's groundwater. Um, in different parts of the world, groundwater can be a few meters below the surface. In other places, it could be hundreds of meters below the surface. And so it is a very large reservoir of fresh water that we can be using. Well, when we talk about groundwater, we also can talk about surface water, the lakes and rivers. 
and how they interact with our groundwater. So what we put onto our surface, if we spill gasoline, if we have industry, at how us as humans and what we do in our rivers and streams and on our land impacts this very important uh, resource of water. So I could study water from flowing, but what I really focus on is what's called water quality. Water quality. So contamination can come from a lot of different places. Um, it can come from uh, landfills, um, uh, spills of gasoline stations, illegal dumping. It can come from septic systems or sewer lines, agriculture. Um, industry is a really big one. And so what I'm going to do today is talk about some different sources of pollution that have happened in Southeast Asia and how do we test and look at that contamination and how it goes through this system. Oh, there's no time. I have to go back. Okay. Um, so uh, when we look at pollution, there's two ways we can look at it. There is what's called point source pollution. So point source, we can point at that company. We can point at that industry that's out there that is polluting water, that is dumping things into water and killing fish. We can point to a particular thing. Well, while we can do that and we can talk about that industry, most water pollution is what's called non-point source, meaning that it rains. And as it rains, all of that water that's going across our roadways is picking up all that pollution that we, we put onto our roads. Um, agriculture kind of is everywhere, and so when we have agriculture, it kind of diffuses our pollution out. So when we look at pollution, we can look at a point source, we can point at it, or it can be a general thing that we're doing in our society um, out there. So I'm gonna talk about both types of pollution today. But my first example is gonna be from Myanmar. So um, this was research that I did in, in the city of Mandalay. So for, uh, just so people know, so here's the country of Myanmar. Uh, we were working in Mandalay, which is the center part of the country. This is the Arawadi River right here. You do see my pointer, right? Do you see me moving something? Yeah, okay. So uh, this is the Arawadi River right here, and this is the city of Mandalay. And so we were working on a research project in the southern part of the city. So when I went around the town, we had a couple different sources of water for people. So first of all, there was these dug wells. These are these big open wells that were dug down about six to 10 meters. They're about one to two meters deep. Uh, people used buckets to get water out for cleaning and bathing inside of them. And so this was one source of drinking water and cleaning water. The other type of water is what's called tube wells. These are wells that are installed using PVC pipe. So here's the PVC pipe. They're put into the ground and then you can put a pump and pump up that fresh drinking water. So we had two different sources of drinking water supplies for the people to drink in the community. We looked around and saw where were some of the potential contaminations of that fresh water. We want to make sure that people have access to clean drinking water. And so we looked around and saw what some of the pollution events could be. 
Well, one of them was wastewater. So wastewater, sewage, and open sewer canals. I mentioned about how fresh water from sewer canals um, and the surface can get into our groundwater, and that's our drinking water supply. So having the sewage in these open canals can leak into the drinking water supply. So as the ground, as that water is sitting inside of these ditches and th in areas, that water can go and recharge or seep into the ground and then pollute their drinking water supply. So the sewage was then uh, gone through rivers, this is just all plastic waste, and then uh, uh, pumped into the Arawati River. So people who live downstream from this, their fish, their uh, seafood, was getting impacted by the sewage from the community. We were also looking at river contamination. This particular uh, monk was saying that one day, all of a sudden, the water near his, like the river near it, turned purple. And all of a sudden, it smelled really bad, and all the fish died. So he knew that upstream, there was some new industries going on, and they had dumped into the water their waste that killed off all the fish. And he was worried about the water he was drinking because that water in the river could go into their drinking water supply. And then we were also looking at algae growing um, on top of the water from too much nutrients in the water, and I'll talk more about that later. So we went around and we collected water. We went to different people's homes and looked at their tube wells, their uh, dug wells, and we, we analyzed the water in a water quality laboratory. And then we looked at the water quality and we just tested rivers and groundwater throughout the area. So what I'm gonna do today is focus on a couple interesting pieces of this information. So right up in here is a dug well, and this is the sewage right here. So we have a little bit of soil. So if you've ever taken a hydrogeology class or a hydraulics class, you know, water flows from higher elevation to lower elevation. So the water in this stream here is sewage, and the water in the well is a little bit lower. So that water from the sewage infiltrates or seeps into that soil and gets into that well. Well, the people who use this well for bathing, cleaning, and, and drinking, they, we asked them about their water, and they said, oh, sometimes it smells a little bit. And when we sampled the well, we noticed a fish living inside of their drinking water. And we go, why is there a fish in here? And they said, oh, when the fish is dead and it dies, we know the water's no good. So they would stop drinking it when the fish died. So there was a fish living inside of their drinking water supply. So we looked at this and said, well, you only have a few meters of soil to filter out that sewage. Do you think the water is safe to drink? And they're like, well, yeah, it's safe. So we tested the water to see if this water was safe and sweet. So we looked at different parameters, and this is one of the things that I do regularly, and I can do this almost anywhere, is we look at a series of tests to see if the water is clean. So first we looked at pH. So pH, you know, acids and bases, we measured it at 7.65. That's good, because our range is between 6.5 and 8.5 is healthy range of water. Seven is that average. We're good on that. Then we looked at what's called EH. This is uh, how oxidizing or reducing the environment is. We live in an oxidizing environment. We live with oxygen in our atmosphere. So fish like an oxidizing environment. They want to have oxygen inside of the water so that they can breathe. So we measured the amount of that, and it was uh, 230 millivolts. Again, from an electrical point of view, it's looking at that exchange of, of um, uh, currents in there. And it was a positive number, meaning that there was a lot of oxygen available in the water, which is good for the fish and good for the people. Then we looked at electrical conductivity. How, how much ions are in the water? So distilled water will have no ions in it. While we get into salt water, it has a lot of ions, positive and you know, cations and anions, negative and uh, positively charged ions in the water. 
and that will transmit electricity through it. Well, we don't want it to be above 1,500 millisiemens per centimeter. Well, if it goes above this, the water starts to taste salty to us. It means that you'd have to use desalinization in order to remove the salts. This water was at 3,000 almost, so twice as salty as it's supposed to be. Well, why is the water so salty? Well, the sewage here, when you eat food, do you, you put salt on your food, right? We all like salt. We have to have salt to survive. We need that sodium chloride. So sewage has a lot of salt into it, and that salt moves very easily with the water. So we can say this water had a lot of ions inside of it. It had a lot of that salt in there. The next parameter that we looked at was called turbidity. Turbidity is how cloudy is the water. Well, you don't want to drink water that looks cloudy. We like that nice, clean, it's perfectly clear. Well, we can only see so much cloudiness, but there could still be particles inside of that water that we cannot see. It's just not enough of it for our eyes. So we have a measurement called turbidity units, NTUs. And when we look at turbidity, we want it less than one, meaning that that water is crystal clear. This water had a turbidity of 10, meaning that there was particles floating in that water. Barely you could see them. So it would look clean, but there was just enough particles in there to, to make it cloudy. The next parameter was sulfate. Sulfate, when you drink it too much, it can cause constipation. It can cause your gut to hurt if you have too much sulfate in your water. The legal limit for that is 250 milligrams per liter. This particular water had 400. Well, where was the sulfate coming from? Again, from food, from sewage. We put uh, like monosodium glutamate. There's different types of things that have sulfate into it that gets into the water and can make it in there. Chloride, sodium chloride. Again, that is um, chloride is from our salt. Again, that was supposed to be a highest limit of 50, and there was 514. So it was 10 times more chloride in that water than should be. Nitrate which is a, um, a contaminant from agriculture, but it also comes from sewage. Um, nitrates cause problems in drinking water when they're above a level of 40. What they can cause is what's called blue baby syndrome. Blue baby syndrome, infants that are less than six months of age, they have different hemoglobin than us as adults. And when they br drink water that has nitrate in it, it starves all their cells, and they start to turn blue. So when we look at babies, they can't drink water with nitrates in it. It's very toxic for them. They, will, they, they suffocate. They're, all their cells start to suffocate. So this water had 167 when the legal limit was 40. So it had a lot of these compounds into it. Fluoride, we, we use that in our toothpaste to keep our teeth strong. The legal limit should be 1.5. Here we had some extra fluoride. Again, it can come from sewage, and it also can come from the geology. Um, arsenic can cause brain damage, especially with children, here, uh, learning impairments. And uh, its legal limit is 10. The current studies are showing that it should be less than 10. It should be at 5. This had 30. And this arsenic here is coming from the, uh, the river itself, from the geology of the area. And then the last one we tested here was E. coli, which is a bacteria found inside of our guts. Um, it's inside of all of our, our, our um, uh, intestinal tract. We never want to find that bacteria, because if we find E. coli inside of our water, then we know that there is active feces in our water live bacteria that can cause us to get sick, diarrhea, vomiting in there. So the legal limit for this is zero, and we were finding over 100 in there. So this water that the woman who is like, oh yeah, we use this all the time for cleaning, bathing, we use it for cooking, should she be drinking this water? No, we shouldn't be even close to this water. This should be sealed off because it is so close to this, the sewage. 
So groundwater is that water that's moving through the ground and you assume that it's clean, but without testing it, you will never know if it really truly is clean because you cannot always see all these different contaminants. Now I'm gonna talk about another project we did in Myanmar where we were looking at an industry. This is an industry uh, where they dye uh, threads and fabric. So textile dyeing, so to make the longis, has been in the Amarapura region of Mandalay since 1822. So since that time, this is when the king said this is the area in which all of the fabrics are going to be made. So they were been dyeing the fabrics to make all the different colors of the, of the longis in there. And so these are done by people's homes. So people would sit there and this is an unregulated practice. So this is an industry that is done in people's backyards to make fabrics to be sold throughout the country. So the dyeing is done hands on. They're, they boil the water, they use the dyes, they're dipping the, the threads that makes the fabric in there. They get the thread in from India um, and then they dye it in their backyards. So all of these buckets right here and this right here, they, they dump it right onto the ground um, and I'll show some pictures of that. So they get the dyes to make the different colors here. They go to the, sh the market and they can buy whatever color they would like to manufacture that day. So whatever color they want to make, they can get them. And these dyes all come from China or India. And so we asked the people, do you know what's in these dyes? And they're like, no, we don't know. They're handling them with their hands. They're dumping them onto the ground and they did not know what was inside of these dyes. So we went to the people's homes and we asked them about uh, you know, the dyeing process. What do you do with the waste that's on here? And they're like, oh, we just put it onto the ground and what we do is we dispose of it right here and this, this little canals right here go into a lake, uh, Tagaman Lake, which is one of the main sources of food for that community. They use it for fishing, um, there's shellfish that are coming out of here. And this river right here changes color throughout the day. So you can kind of see a little bit of green here on the edges, but sometimes it's pink, it's purple, it's blue. And as people are walking through it, like the dogs would walk through it and their fur would change colors as they were getting into it. But this was disposed of into the lake. Um, so all of this dye was then just, oh, it's fine. We'll put it out into the lake. The solution to pollution is dilution. We're just gonna dilute it into the lake. It's fine. Oop. So then they would weave all of the, the longis here, and this is all the thread that's being laid out to dry. Then all of this is taken and manufactured into the longis. So we collected the different dyes that were there. All These are all the different colors that we could find. And we said, well, where do they come from? Most of them are from China. One of them was from India, the indigo, the blue. And we analyzed the different colors. We, we put them into a machine that says, well, okay, what kind of metals or what are they made out of? So we can, we can determine what, what was in them. So we sampled dug wells, those big wells from people's homes. We sampled the tube wells. We looked at samples from uh, upstream, so where there wasn't any of this dying. And then we looked at the areas in which there was a lot of it, and then we looked downstream from it. So we were comparing clean, clean water to the dye operations to downstream to see how this was impacting people's homes and lives. So we went into people's homes and they would have these uh, tube wells here that they would use for drinking water purposes because they were told don't drink the, the surface water, drink the water out of the tube well. When we talked to the families there, we asked them about do you notice anything with color or anything? And they says, oh yeah, our rice will change color with time. Our rice is now yellow and it's, you know, it's supposed to be white. And then it, sometimes it's different colors so it'll have an odd taste. And we says, well, do you think it's anything to do with you dying up here? And they're like, no, no, our rice is just yellow. And you're like, okay, that's, that's not healthy um, in there. So we tested wells uh, where there wasn't any of the dying 
and this is what we found. So we tested a whole series of heavy metals inside of that water in there. Well, we did find some sodium, but I already talked about sodium. Remember the salt that we put on all of our food? It's high in the groundwater because of the sewage getting into the drinking water in these wells. So we were expecting to see high levels of sodium. When we tested the tube wells that were right next to the dyeing operation, we started to be very alarmed by the heavy metals that were inside of the water that people were using for cooking and drinking. Part of them contained aluminum. Aluminum, you know, it's aluminum can is fine, but when it's inside of water, it can cause mental and kidney problems. We also had high levels of iron, so it made the water red. We found lead. Lead poisoning. So lead, even in small concentrations, can cause mental uh, and impairments in children, especially, and adults. So any amount of lead in water is extremely toxic to people, can cause um, a lot of mental health issues. And then one of the most alarming was thallium. Thallium is at a legal limit of three parts per billion. It is one of the most toxic metals that's out there. You should never have thallium in anything that you're using. But these dyes contain thallium because they were coming in from China and they were not regulated. And so they were containing very high levels of very toxic heavy metals. Then we looked at the pipes of the water that was coming out. So today when we sampled, it was pink. They were doing pink color of the thing. And we sampled this pink water to see what was in this water that was going into the environment. Again, no matter where we sampled, we found aluminum. We found uh, lead, extremely high concentrations of lead, iron. We found nickel, again, can cause a lot of mental health problems. Sodium, which we already knew about, and thallium. So we know that the source of the pollution in that water that was causing the rice to turn yellow, that was causing problems, we asked the families in that area, is there, do you notice that there's any problems? And they're like, yeah, people don't live real long in this area, and we have a lot of mental, you know, mental, you know, some issues. It's probably coming from a lot of the heavy metals that are getting into their food supply. So when we look at it, we were going to like looked upstream at the tube wells. I mean, at the dug wells, we looked at tube wells where they were doing it, where they were effluent there, and we noticed that the water was going from here down to the lake where they were doing their fishing. And so we were finding high levels of all these different types of metals inside of this groundwater that was supposed to be their clean drinking water supply. And so we let the people know in the region um, what was going on, and we hope that some of the authorities in the area will say, okay, maybe don't dump all of your waste from your, drink, from your dying operations onto the ground. Is there something we can do in order to make it so that the water is cleaner in that area, especially for the, the residents? So this research was all done in Myanmar. Now I'm going to switch focus and talk about the research that I've just been doing in Cambodia. Um, so um, I had two main research projects that I was looking at in Cambodia. One of them was with the Royal University of Phnom Penh. Uh, this was research that we started back in 2017, 2018, and we were looking at the impact of urbanization. You are creating land here, reclaimed land. What does that have to do with water quality and our urbanization? So we'll talk about that. Um, I was also doing another project uh, with the uh, um, Institute for Technology of Cambodia, so their engineering school, looking at groundwater flow, especially in a uh, agricultural areas. So first one we're going to look at is water quality of the Bong Chek Ek uh, wastewater treatment plant West Lens in Phnom Penh. This research started off as a, a project with my graduate student. His name was Sammy Malo. His mother was from Cambodia, and his father was an American. And when he wanted to do his uh, master's research, he wanted to come back to Cambodia to do a project from where his family was from. So we started this project in 2017. So again, that raw sewage went through the canals into the city. And what the city of Phnom Penh does, it's surrounded by wetlands in the area. And they have these wetlands. There's a southern one and a northern one. These wetlands act as wastewater treatment plants. They, they treat the wastewater. 
So all of the water from the city of Phnom Penh is, goes to these wetlands, and the plants and animals that are inside of the wetlands treat the waste so that when it gets uh, discharged or comes out into the Basak River, it's clean. In Cambodia, their main food is all seafood, so it's all fish, shellfish, um, you know, the Cambodia, uh, Khmer lobsters, it's all coming from water and rice. So all of their food is water-based. And so when you're discharging an entire city of about two million people's waste into a river, you can hurt your fishing supply, and we'll talk more about that. So part of the city planning here was there was this land south of the city that they're like, well, we need to expand more. We need more land for big skyscrapers, for more development. So what can we do? Well, let's fill in the wetlands so we have more land, okay? So they started off in 20, I'm gonna show some pictures. So in 2017, when we were there, there was a road built through the wetlands here. And by 2023, when I was here just a couple weeks ago, the dots are my sampling sites, most of the wetland is filled in now. About 50% of the wetland has been filled in to make room for skyscrapers, an Aeon Mall, uh, you know, um, in that area. So the wetlands act as a really good treatment. It was, it was a really good for the city of Phnom Penh to have these wetlands. Because what we would do is, especially like in the United States, we would take what's called primary treatment. We would remove the solids from your waste, and then we would treat, we would digest all the organic material. So we use bacteria to eat the organic material. Then we would put it through a wetland to clean up, to polish the water. What the wetland plants do is use up anything else that's inside of that waste water to clean it up before it is discharged into the river. Well, what was happening in Phnom Penh was they were taking the primary water, so all of the sewage from all of the homes and everything in the city was going through a metal grate to remove like plastic. Then it was going through this wetland that was really large. It would clean up all the water before it was discharged. But now they're filling in the wetland. So the, we wanted to know is as we went from this to this, did this impact the water quality in that region? So uh, one of the other things that they're doing is for city planning is to build a couple wastewater treatment plants. They haven't built them yet. They're in the process of building it right now. So as they're filling in their only treatment for all of their sewage, they, are, they don't have any way of treating it. So that means raw sewage is going into the rivers, which then supplies their food. So we went around the lake, um, into the sewage lake, and one of the things that we really noticed was what's called floating agriculture. So we first of all, we noticed all the homes next to it. They had all of these pipes that just drained right into this very, very black water. So it was this pitch black water, smelled, and it was just everybody's homes, all that water just went right into this lake. And then there was agriculture on top of this lake. So floating agriculture. Um, what it is is on these mats here, they grow certain vegetables that are used in Cambodian cuisine. So a couple of them that are really important are these, the water spinach. Um, when you get a meal in Cambodia, they always give you water spinach. They put water spinach on everything. It's a flavor and it's also a vegetable and a water mimosa. It is very common, and these are grown on these floating agriculture on the sewer lake that then go in to feed the people of, of Phnom Penh. So this is what the farming looks like. They put down these mats. They then grow the plants into it, and they use boats in order to go out to get the uh, vegetables and, and harvest into there. So back in 2017, you can see on here all the different floating agriculture. There was a lot of floating agriculture, a lot of food production going on in the lake in 2017. By 2023, you can see all this sand is being dug up in one area to use to fill in this wetland. 
and we, that's a whole other research project where we're going to look at what happens to the communities when you dig up all of their land to fill in somewhere else with the sand. So the sand was being used in order to just fill in the wetland. And this area in red I'm going to be focusing on, and I'm going to be talking about it. And so you can see it here and still see it in 2023 with the people's homes. The farmers go to the market and then they're like, oh, well, we've got pests. We've got insects eating all of my plants. What can we do? Or I want my plants to grow more and more. So they would go to the market and at the market, they would find these, you know, the herbicides, pesticides, fertilizers. They did not know because a lot of this is uh, from Vietnam. They would just put it on the fields and they don't know what they're putting on. So they were trying to help their farms and their food grow more, but they didn't know what chemicals they were using, what nutrient, what they were putting onto the fields to make their food grow. They just were told, here, just use these packets, put it on there, it'll grow. And they would use these sprayers here to spray on top of their agriculture. So they were filling in the lake. So these are just some pictures from over time. So this is 2023. It was very rural in that area. Here's 2016 as the city is starting to grow more. 2010, we still had open water in uh, the, the, the bong here. And then as 2012, they started to build the road. They started to dissect it. By 2016, most of it was starting to get filled in. By 2022, a lot of it had been filled in with sand. Um, so what we wanted to know was what is the impact of all of this filling in of the lake on water quality and what happens to that sewage? Is it still being treated? So we sampled, again, we, when we do sampling, we sample from what's coming in to the middle and what was going out the end. Just like we did with the dyeing, we did that with this particular project too. So this is the raw sewage going into there. It's just just gets pumped right into it, and this is the floating agriculture. This is the pilot treatment plant, wastewater treatment plant that they're putting in. This pilot plant is about the size for a good community of about 50,000 people, not for a city of 2 million. Um, so they're just trying that now. Even though they've filled it in, they're now just building something to treat all of that waste. Um, there's other sources of industry around the lake that dispose, like I showed with the uh, dyeing, they dispose of their waste into um, these sewage things and they just dump it into the rivers. And then we looked at the end of it. So what was being discharged into the Basak River? So we looked at the influent, we looked in the middle, and then we looked at the end to see does the water get cleaned up while um, it going through this lake. So just to give you some ideas of ways it looked differently, so in 2017, this is a sampling. This is that same location in 2023. Um, most of the land is filled in. This is an Aon Mall. So you've got Aon Malls here, Ion Malls here. It's the same mall here. And the lake was being filled in. Over here, uh, the, one of the farmers who farms this area was there was two red flags. And he says, yep, that's where the road is going in within the next six months. They're going to build a road right through where his house is um, in that area so that they can have more development and more roads. And then we looked at where the, the sewage lake discharges or goes into the Basak River and that community. So we looked at it from the influent down and to the end. So in 2018, when the lake was only partially filled in, all they had in right now was this the road going through the middle. When we looked at the water going from the beginning to the end, that's the red, we saw a decrease in phosphate. So phosphate is used for fertilizer to make the plants grow more. We saw that throughout the, the, the lake, the wetland, it decreased the amount of phosphate. Well, why did it decrease the amount of phosphate? The plants were using it. So the plants were using the phosphate that was inside of the water and using it to grow. We looked at ammonia, and ammonia decreased. Ammonia is from sewage. You get that into there. Again, the ammonia was being used by the plants and being broken down. And our chloride, that salt that we talked about earlier, was being decreased too because the salt was then dis um, um, precipitating out, getting into the, into the bomb. 
So we were seeing that the Bong actually did what we call ecosystem services. It was an ecosystem that was servicing us. It was doing its job. It was cleaning up that water so that when the water got discharged or into the Basak River where the fishing was occurring, it was cleaning it up. So we went back to those same locations again, and when we resampled, we could only get to about 60% of our samples. The other 40% were now, like one of them was under the mall, um, some of them there were roads there, so we couldn't go back to some of our sampling locations. So we sampled um, our water, and this is what's called a Piper diagram. A Piper diagram is a way of looking at the water chemistry, so we're looking at our, our, our anions and our cations within the water. And by comparing them, we can see uh, the chemistry of the water, like what kind of fingerprint does the water have? When I look at this, one thing I've noticed from looking at this diagram is that the water from 2018 versus the water when we sampled in 2023 has changed. The water is now closer to sewage. So we sampled water wells in people's homes and now we're seeing all of the water looks like sewage. The chemistry of the water, the fingerprint of the water looks like sewage. When before, in 2018, we still had wells that were good for drinking, that were still good for fishing, for still good for things. Now we're just seeing all of the water look like sewage. And when we look at it um, from the dry chemistry, we're getting the water to look more like that. And we're also noticing that the water that's coming in and the water that's going out of the lake are looking the same. So before, in 2018, there was a difference of the water when it was coming in and when it was leaving. Now all the water looks like sewage. And so what we're noticing is that ecosystem services, that wetland wasn't doing its job anymore because it wasn't there. This, uh, one of the things we noticed was when we were sampling that one home that's gonna be, the road is gonna go through his house, um, there was a fish, someone had just gone fishing out of the lake and they caught a fish and it was still alive. And we're like, oh, are you gonna eat that? And he goes, oh no, we can't eat that for a couple days. The fish just came out of the raw sewage, it tastes bad, it's toxic, it, it, it has a funny taste. So they put it into fresh water, into clean water for about two to three days to get rid of some of the bad taste out of the water, out of the fish. And so they, they'd have to wait a couple days before they could eat this fish. So, because the, the sewage was just so toxic to, to them. So we looked at electrical conductivity, how salty was the water. One of the other things that we looked at was wet season versus dry season. I'm not gonna talk about that today too much besides saying that during the wet season, we would see more dilution of these things, so there was more water in the lake, so it would dilute some of the sewage out. During the dry season, we would see that it was more concentrated in there. So we have to go back during wet season in order to see if that effect is still in place today. Um, so when we looked at the water quality, I mentioned uh, E. coli or the bacteria in our gut that causes uh, diarrhea. Um, all the groundwater samples did not have any bacteria in it, which was good. At least the groundwater samples were clean from that. But when we looked at the chemistry of the water, we could notice that people, that that water looked like, so it had a lot of the uh, characteristics of sewage. We found ammonia in there. And so we told a lot of the people don't use this water for drinking, use it only if you have to for cleaning. Well, a lot of the people told us that the pipe water they get from the city gets shut off all the time. And so this is their only source of drinking water and water that they have, reliable. And so we told them, well, try not to drink it, but they're like, well, you know, how am I supposed to spend money to buy water when the city water gets turned off? So we have to be thinking about water quality throughout the entire system. So we still have some work to do there. We have to see if this wastewater treatment plant is enough, how much land has actually been, been gone because of the um, filling it in, and then determine how much the ecosystem services this wetland actually provided. And have we reached a tipping point where this water is not getting treated anymore? Um, so the last project I'm gonna talk about is what's called Watt Health. 
um, this is a project with the Institute of Technology of Cambodia and the in uh, Research Institute of Development from France. In this particular project, what they were looking at is during wet season, when the rice fields all get flooded, and so when we're getting um, water going into the rice paddies, what is happening when we put in these canals and we maintain these canals along the rice paddies, does that impact the water quality? And do, is there drinking water for the communities in that area? When we went to these areas, we asked the people, what, what do you drink for water? And they're like, well, we get piped water from the government, but when we try to put in wells, the water tastes funny. The water is toxic or the water, they did not know what was wrong with their water. So we were trying to see if there was any sources of drinking water for them in this community. So along the Basak River, this is downstream from Phnom Penh. So this would be the water that comes from that sewage. It gets dumped into the Basak River, and then it comes down to here where they grow the rice. So each of these canals here, they take the water from the Basak River, it goes into these canals, and then the farmers pump this water into their irrigation for corn, rice, mangoes, bananas, all the different agriculture along these particular canals. And then they have the wet season versus the dry season. And so we were sampling during the dry season to see what is the water quality like in the groundwater versus the surface water. And then we'll go back in the wet season to see if that changes the chemistry. So here's the city of Phnom Penh. We're dealing with this area called um, uh, Lokton. Um, and so we were looking at two canals um, along the river. In one of the canals called Prek Chang, uh, it was a, a channelized. The French came in and they channelized this, they maintained this canal, they made sure the water flowed, they put in a gate so that when the water comes up, they can, they can regulate how much water was inside of this particular um, uh, irrigation canal. And then the next canal over, which was right next to it, just a few meters away, was uh, Prektwich. And this one that wasn't maintained at all. So what we wanted to do was compare and contrast two irrigation canals uh, to see if there was differences in the water quality and how the water uh, moved, especially the groundwater. So along the canals, the uh, farmers would pump the water from the canal up to the fields to water them during dry season. And then during wet season, this would fill up and then they would open, uh, they would still pump the water across this little dike area here into their fields. While in um, Praktuich, they would just let the water rush into their fields. They didn't do as much um, uh, in, into those areas. The other thing that we noticed within this area here was there was these little discharge points right here along the edge of the canal. So they would pump the water from here up into the farm field, and then these pipes along the base of the hill, base of the thing, were draining the excess groundwater. So the groundwater, the water would go into the farm field, it would percolate through the soil, and then it would come out of these pipes here and go back into the thing. So we were looking at the water quality from these things here to see does that water quality get better or does it change as it goes through the agricultural soil? So we set up a chemistry lab in the back of a car um, so we could test all of the water right there at the, at the point of the thing. So we would set up a, a testing laboratory. And then what we did was we, we, this is from a picture from a drone, we were like, they were uh, mapping these um, irrigation canals into the area. We installed some wells. So this is a, a, a tube well that we were installing right here. This is called a drive point well because you're driving, you're hitting the hammer over and over again. And that drives this pipe into the ground so that we could sample the groundwater. Some of the water we brought back to the laboratory and we tested it in the lab. And we were looking at major cations and anions inside of the laboratory. So we looked at what, those Piper diagrams again, and what we noticed is the water that's inside of any of the canals right here is, looks like the river water. 
So that's good. It means that the canal water is the river water that's coming from the Basak River. When we looked at the groundwater, the water that was coming out of these, these tubes on the sides of the banks here that was coming through it, that water is very different from the water that was coming from these wells that were inside of the mango fields. So uh, there was this well, and you can kind of see it right here. It's this tube into the ground right here, and this is a mango grove right here. This particular well, we sampled this particular well. It was about um, 40 meters deep, and we looked at that water. And we noticed that it's very different than the water that is coming out of the sides here. So we know that the water chemistry is different. That means their sources are very different. Well, part of the reason we did this is these deep wells that are here have a lot of conductivity, meaning they're very, very, very salty. So salty that um, our normal limit was 1,500 or 1 1.5 millisiemens. These were at 6 and 10 millisiemens. So 10 times, uh, I mean 1,000 times greater than um, what we should be drinking. We noticed that the water that was coming from the irrigation canals had phosphates in it. So that was coming from agriculture. And uh, one of the other things that we looked at was the salt. These deep wells that were there were very, very salty, had a lot of conductivity. And when we looked at the heavy metals in there, we noticed there was a lot of arsenic. So the water there was extremely toxic. The amount of arsenic that you can drink is at 10, and these are at 563 and 37. So really high level toxics of iron, iron, manganese, and um, arsenic were found inside of the groundwater that was deeper down in that area. So the shallow water, the shallow groundwater was okay. It looked like the sewage water, I mean like the, uh, the river water, and it was a nice flowing system in that, the agricultural area. But the people in this area can't drink the groundwater because it is toxic from arsenic inside of it. So we can. So we were talking to the farmers, and we're like, maybe we can provide you water. And we're like, no, we can't. We cannot have you drinking this water. It is very toxic to drink. So they have to rely on the surface water. But what we're thinking is that that shallow system when they irrigate and the water comes out. Could we harness that water for a drinking water supply? So in conclusion, a lot of our shallow water resources are used for irrigation, and we might be able to use that for some sort of drinking water or water supply. The deep water is not, used, is not safe for human consumption. And the dry and wet season, we have to go back to um, sample during wet season to see if the same trends that we're seeing during dry season and then we're also sampling for pesticides. So this is just uh, uh, pesticides. The samples are in my bag right now, and they'll be taken back to the United States when I go back in June. And with that, um, that is all I have to say today. Um, so in conclusion, uh, there is a lot of issues when it comes to groundwater, and we need to be able to test that water in order to be able to know what the problems are to be able to help our future communities have fresh drinking water. And with that, I thank you for today for listening. Mm -hmm. Sure, if you'd like to bring them up, yeah. So I have a couple things here uh, for demonstration purposes. Um, this right here is, um, uh, it's called a water level meter. And what you do is, um, in order to see like in these tube wells, so in these tube wells that are in there, if we want to know how far down is the water, what we can do is we can put this into the water and we turn it on. There's an electrical wire that goes down into here and it there's two parts to the wire. One hits the bottom here and one hits this. And when it touches water, it completes the circuit and it beeps. And so on this tape, there's a measuring. So you can lower this down into the well. You lower this down and you can measure how deep the water is by using that idea that water conducts electricity. So this is a very simple device. 
um, to be able, it's weighted so it goes down into the water, into there. And this is how we determine how deep it is down into the water. So this is called a water level meter. Another way we can get water out of a well is because, you know, right here there's water inside of this well. We can't just, you know, scoop it out. So what we use is what this is called a baler. And what it is is there's a ball inside of here and there's a weight at the bottom. So when we lower this down into the water, the weight pulls it down. And then when the water comes in, it pushes the ball out of the way. And then when we lift it up, the ball closes up the bottom down there, and so we can bring up about 500 milliliters of water from the well. So this is called a baler. So we can go down into the water, bring it up, and then pour out the water. And so just that ball in there holds the water into there, and then we have some weight. So these are, this is called a baler. So, and this last thing that we're going to be talking about here is uh, testing for bacteria in water. So, does this water have that bacteria that causes diarrhea? So, inside of here, you put the water in there, and then you've got this little piece of paper that's got a hydrogen sulfide testing strip in there. And if this turns black, it means it has that bacteria from your gut inside of it. So, we tested this water yesterday. You want to say where it's from? Uh, sample was te tested at Permatang Nibong uh, River uh, near to our university. Yeah. And so it still doesn't have any of the disease-causing bacteria inside of it, some of the E. coli inside of it. So that was good. Um, usually groundwater will have this in there. So you've got that water was pretty good. Like when we looked at the chemistry of it, it looked really good. So one of the things that um, my goal here is to look at these different types of ways of looking at chemistry can we do these same types of testing here in Malaysia? Can we look at irrigation, so from the, the, from the irrigation of, of, of uh, the rice? Is there industry? You, you have a lot of industrial development right now in, in your city. Can that lead to pollution of water, um, which then affects our fish, our livelihood, and our fish? And so this is part of some of the equipment that we used yesterday. Um, I'm leaving the water level meter and the baler here. Um, so that you guys can start doing some testing of groundwater in this region. And then we've, we've been talking about some ideas for how elect, uh, different types of sensors that you can use in order to do this chemistry. Is there something we could put inside of these wells that from a chemical, like that measures that conductivity for us all the time? Because that conductivity is just, you know, two wires and looking at the electrical, could we put in something that measures it every five minutes to see if that rain event, or one time we were doing a project in Chicago, we're in the middle of the night. This company was dumping all of their waste in the middle of the night when no one was around. And the only way we found it was we put in some sensors that measured overnight, and in the middle of the night at two o'clock in the morning, we would see this big peak in temperature and a change in the pH and so we could actually point our fingers at this industry for dumping waste when nobody was around to see it. So could you do some measuring of that? Could you look at when there's seasonal changes? Could you look at um, impact of development in your area? So these are the types of things that maybe you could build sensors or do something with like telemetry where you're using cell phone signals where the signal comes into a cell phone and then that cell phone signal is sending us the, the results. A lot of this um, instrumentation I showed here is all electronics. This is a, a spectrophotometer. Could we be developing sensors that test for this inside of the water? So there's a lot of ways that we could be using uh, electrical engineers working with people like myself, which are groundwater people, to come up with better ways to monitor groundwater and monitor water so that we know that the water is clean before or if there's a problem before it impacts human health. Can we put up sensors that indicate that there's going to be a problem soon? And can we, can we outfit an area so that we can monitor it better? So that's part of what, what I would like to do here is to work on this pro type of a project. 
Is there any questions that anybody has about the, the presentation? Thank you so much, Dr. Melissa, for the enlightening speech on water quality in Southeast Asia. We actually have one question from our staff through our YouTube channel uh, by Siti Noor. So she asked, does it mean that the tube near the paddy field is not recommended? So that's the question. And we have also have other questions later, but this is the first question. So is it recommended or not? So the wells near the paddy fields. Uh, so what we'd like to do is see that the water that goes through the soil, the soil and the sediment should clean the water as it goes through. But if we put too much uh, pollutions into the, into the rivers, then the soil reaches its capacity for being able to clean it up. So near the, the rice fields right now, it's OK. But what we need to do is monitor it with time to know when is it going to become too much. So right now, it's OK. Um, these homes that are right located, this is um, part of the bong that's um, in the sewage lake right here. These people, I wouldn't recommend them drinking the water that comes from the things. But the ones that are next to the paddy fields, those, those shallow water wells, they could be used if there was additional treatment to be used for cleaning. So the question is, is about the, the fish that was living in the sewage lake, and then they put it into fresh water. Let me see if I can get back to the picture here. There it is. So the fish right here. Uh, so the people think that's what it does. The people who are there say, oh, it tastes better. Um, would I eat it after a couple days on fresh water? No. Um, uh, does it mean that it's safe? We would have to test it. So part of the reason that... Um, uh, and I don't think in a couple days we'll remove all the toxins. After the fish has been living in there, it takes a long time for something inside of our bodies to get expelled. So when we consume things, it takes a while. It would probably take more than a couple days. But the person just says, oh, it tastes better. So it's more of they just think it's fine um, in there. Uh, they also do this with the mollusks, so the clams and oysters that, you know, you have two shells. Those are called filter feeders. And what that means is the animal that's inside of the shell sucks the water into its body and then eats whatever's inside of it. So it concentrates all of the waste inside of it. So what they'll do is they'll say, oh, we'll just put it in some fresh water for a couple days. That'll clean out all the dirt that's inside of it. And we've done testing on those little shellfish before, and we still find viruses, uh, disease-causing organisms, and toxic metals in there, even after a couple of days. So I don't eat those. <laughs> I don't touch those. So back in um, Myanmar, where we had all these beautiful colors, I mean, they are gorgeous, uh, you know, all these just colors of the longis that are inside of here, will that get into us? I can answer a couple of things with that. So first of all, when you wash the clothing for the first time, a lot of that heavy metals will go into that wash water. It'll wash out some of those heavy metals inside of there, okay? So depending on what the, the, where the, the metal is with inside of it. So some of it will be washed out with the washing, and so you shouldn't be handling that water that comes out of it. But I can also say, like, um, uh, this is a, um, so originally green was a really hard color to make, okay? So in order to make green dyes, they started using arsenic for making dyes. Nowadays, we don't use this, but about 100 years ago, we had what was called arsenic green, and it was a green color that was arsenic. So what was happening is the women were drying their dresses green because they wanted to have green. It was a really rare color. So very wealthy women would put on these green dresses. 
But as they sweated under their armpits, that sweat would release the arsenic into their bodies, and they were dying from the dyes inside of their, uh, the, from, the, from sweating into it. And then children, they would put green on wallpapers in the room, and as the wallpapers got wet and moist, it would release the um, arsenic into the atmosphere, into the rooms, and it was hurting children too. So in the past, there was arsenic as a problem. They don't use arsenic in these dyes anymore, but they are using aluminum, um, uh, the thallium that's in there, and it does get released into the water and probably into the sweat areas of the body. So you would have to be careful if you wore these, um, where you are wearing them and at what times on that. Oh, there's some questions. So the question is about like this water here. So say somebody was drinking this water up in this well here. Here's the chemistry. Can boiling the water help make the water clean to drink? Okay. So boiling water is great to remove E. coli. So this E. coli and this bacteria, when we boil water, kills off disease-causing bacteria, viruses, parasites. But we need about 10 minutes of boiling in order to kill off everything. But as long as it's boiled, it'll kill this. For chemicals, it has an opposite effect. So when you boil, what happens to the amount of water in that vessel? Part of it goes to steam, right? What does that do to the amount of water left inside of the vessel? It's less. That concentrates, makes it higher concentrations of these chemicals. So when you, have, when you boil water and there's chemical toxins, you actually make it higher levels of those toxins inside the water. So if you have nitrates, phosphates, so you don't want to boil that water, okay? Other ways to remove it would be like with filtration, um, so you, a reverse osmosis, RO systems. Um, there's other types of filtration that you can to remove these chemicals. Uh, desalinization, or how you make distilled water, so in your bottled water, a lot of times they tell you it's RO, so reverse osmosis. They use UV light. UV light kills the bacteria. So that water that comes out of your bottled water a lot of times has got the treatments, both treatments. So great question. Um, yeah, you don't want to boil water if you've got chemicals in it, basically. So the question's about machine learning, um, artificial intelligence, I'm assuming, too, kind of yeah, ideas. Yes. So one of the things that really is exciting for us in, in the water quality, we have, we look at this data, and I'm looking at it as a point in time, okay? I, I go out there, and, you know, I have to come from halfway around the world to test this water, okay? And I look at it once. Well, if we could use machine learning where it's looking at the trends, it's looking at this water, and we had sensors inside of it, but it was making predictions and modeling. It was using artificial intelligence to say, hey, when we start to see these trends of chloride starting to, like the, the slope of this line and the slope of this line and this together, modeling it is now going to predict that there's potential pollution in this water. That's exciting because then we can warn people before they even get sick that there might be a problem inside of their water. 
Right now, when we, we test water, especially for like E. coli, it takes 24 hours for us to get the result. So you're drinking water that's already polluted today, and you won't know until tomorrow until you, and you do the testing. So if we had machine learning where it was making predictions, it was learning about the water, it was looking at the, uh, making, using uh, how much rain was coming in, how much flow was through the system, and doing these very complicated looking at it, we could then make predictions and tell people, it's good to drink today, oh, maybe not drink it tomorrow, and do that maybe switch where their flow is coming from. One of the dreams we have is what's called a, a smart uh, uh, pump. So when somebody's drinking uh, water, the pump knows how much water is coming into it so that it's turning itself on and off to maintain. But it's also got sensors into it so that it's learning the water quality and knowing, oh, okay, we, we, can, we can pump right now, but now we have to stop. And so we could use machine learning, we can use AI in order to make better predictions for water quality in, in the future. So very excited about these ideas of how to do it. And if you've got others, I, I'm all for it. Um, I'm what's called an applied scientist. I take what people like yourselves will develop and then try it out in the places. So I have all these really cool locations to try it out in and to see if it works. So you might try it in the laboratory with nice clean water and say, oh yeah, it's working here. But will it work when we have sewage? Okay, let's find some sewage location. Let's test out your models, your machine learning, your ideas out in different environments. Oh, okay. Yeah, so the question's about turbidity. So that's the cloudiness of water. Turbidity can come into drinking water supplies from a lot of different things. So it could be sediment, it could be dirt, it can be bacteria, it can be uh, flocculent, it could be, it could be a lot of different things. So turbidity is a general term for how cloudy is the water. So we remove turbidity by filtering. So you can buy a filter, and that filter, because there are particles within inside of the water, we can put a, a filter in there that removes them. So you can go from like a sand filter, so you can make a big column of sand, pour the water at the top of the sand, and when the water comes out the sand, it should be clean. You can have other types of filters. So we can improve turbidity very easy. Turbidity is one of the simple things that we can fix because we can filter the water to remove out the particles. And those particles can be chemicals, they can be a lot of different things. So it's just a generic term for how cloudy is the water. So we can fix the water for turbidity very easy. We can do E. coli by boiling. We can use UV light. Um, a lot of these types of things can be removed through reverse osmosis. But the problem with reverse osmosis, um, and this is part of the issue with reverse osmosis, is that it um, uses a lot of energy. So when we're talking about a future, especially with climate change, it uses a lot of energy to clean up that water. Filtration is pretty easy. We can use gravity to filter water. But for using reverse osmosis, we use a lot of electricity for it. Um, it also produces a lot of wastewater. So what it is is as the water, not all the water molecules can go through the uh, reverse osmosis, it concentrates on the backside of the filter all of these contaminants in there. Well, all those contaminated water now becomes super concentrated. Now we have to dispose of it somewhere. Well, now we've got super concentrated toxic water. Well, where do we put it? Okay, and then we also waste a lot of water. I did a project in Mexico one time where the area had no drinking water. I mean, they were very low in water, and every drop of water was really precious. And when they were trying to do reverse osmosis, the problem was is all that wastewater was like, well, we could use that water. I mean, you're throwing away water. 
So we have to think about that balancing act between clean drinking water, energy, and then what do we do with our waste when it comes to it? So we have to balance these things in order to have a sustainable future. So alkaline, the question's about alkaline water. So alkaline water means that it is higher in pH. So we normally look at pH levels between 6.5 and 8.5 is our healthy range of water. There are people out there who are looking at this idea of, well, what happens if we have super alkaline water? What can that do to us? Well, first of all, a couple opinions about alkaline water. Alkalinity, what happens when our bodies or organic material gets exposed to very high pH levels, okay? Well, one of the things that happens is what's called spanonification. Spanonification is when you make soap, okay? So if you take organic material and you mix it with lye or very high base materials, you create soap. So I was working in a location where the pH of the water it's in the Guinness Book of World Records. The pH of the water was 12.5 to 13. The highest you can go is 14. So this was water that was in tube wells at this location. The organic material doesn't break down. It turns into soap. And so everything felt kind of soapy on your skin in there. So that's part of alkaline, extreme alkaline conditions, not what they're talking about with alkaline water. So when you're talking alkaline water, you're not talking these 14s, 13s. You're talking like pH 9, okay? So part of the idea is within our stomachs, um, there's, some, there's some studies that are out there about like if you drink alkaline water, it's better for like your health and everything. Well, part of the reason that it makes us feel better when we drink water that's slightly higher in pH is our stomach pH is about a pH of 2. So it's very, very acidic. Our stomach, that's how we digest food. It also helps to kill off bacteria, our stomach acids in there. But when we drink high pH things, it helps to neutralize that. So if we have acid reflux and we have this acid coming up and our stomachs are hurting, sometimes it calms that acid down in our stomach. This is why, especially in America, I don't know around here, but in America, we, people eat Tums it's, uh, uh, and acids. So it makes it lowers the pH of their stomachs because we we actually have a diet that really makes your like acid come up. So a lot of alkaline water is to help that makes your stomach feel better. Um, there are studies out there that say oh there's some health effects other ways, but I haven't I I don't really think that they really do anything. I think our stomach acid really does neutralize any high pHs that are going to come into there. So it's really not having any effect on our bodies. Um, if you only drank pH of 9 water, you would probably start to, well, our food would neutralize it. But um, I think that it, our stomachs and our biology will help to neutralize that. So I, I don't really think that there is any uh, real health effects from our health benefits from it. I mean, and then when we look at the Environmental Protection Agency in the United States, they really say don't go above a pH of 8.5. And a lot of times those alkaline waters also say, oh, only drink like 500 milliliters a day because it could be, it, and so I wouldn't recommend it. Now, the other thing is, is when you have high, uh, low pHs, really acid piece, it, you'll get a lot more heavy metals. So at high pHs, you won't get as many heavy metals into the water, so. So I would. Oh, there's another question up here. Is what water? RO water. Oh, yeah, RO water is good for your health. It's, it's clean. So it doesn't contain any of these toxins inside of the water. Well, yeah, that's part of the problem is that, it, so if the, so like distilled water, RO water, if the only thing you drank was that, yes, it, your, bot, your cells of your body you, you want to go in osmotic pressure, so you, you have your cells, your body have uh, sodium, potassium inside of it, and the water has none, and so it tries to equalize between it. But the thing is, is when we drink just a little bit of water, but we have all this food that we're also eating, it helps to give you those minerals that are inside of there. 
So if the only thing you ever touched for a couple days was RO water and you had no food, nothing else, no orange juice, no juices, nothing else, yeah, it would probably start to, but RO water um, by itself, because our diet is so diverse, a little bit of it is not going to hurt you. Again, it's excess, things that are in excess, like if that's the only thing, yeah, it would cause problems. But personally, I like mineral water better. Like if I have a choice, like if I have two bottles of water and one says mineral, I always get the mineral water because we always need calcium, we need bones and everything like that. So I usually drink mineral water um, and I'm used to that taste of mineral water. Um, but RO water is not going to be toxic to you unless it's the only thing. But I personally, I like the taste of mineral water better. I think that having some minerals in there, um, especially groundwater has a lot of minerals into it because as the water flows through the soil, it picks up those minerals into it. And so that's good for us. Our bodies need those, but it's not going to hurt you. So if I have a choice and I'll pick this, but if the only water, if I had tap water or untreated water, or RO, I'll always take RO. You know, you need treated water. Yeah. One thing with treated water too is like, um, I didn't talk too much about this too, but like just by chlorinating water, by adding chlorine to water, you decrease uh, infant mortality. Like uh, children will survive longer just by adding chlorine to drinking water. Even if you're not drinking it, just by having treated water where there's less bacteria inside of the water, you can increase uh, infant lives tremendously. So using RO water, using these waters is really good. Yes. Is there any what? Oh, sensors for heavy metals. Oh, that's a good question. Not that I know of. I'm trying to think of a sensor that does heavy metals. So we usually take heavy metals and we put it through like an ICP. Uh, inductively coupled plasma. I think you have an ICP -O OES here. Um, usually there are some tests, some like strips and testing that you can do, but they're not sensors for heavy metals. I'm trying to think of a sensor for heavy metals. Not that is really, so that's a great thing that maybe someone can develop. I can't think of a sensor for heavy metals out there. I'm, I'm like racking my brain trying to think of a sensor. We have some for nitrates, finally. That just finally came out where we're measuring for nitrates um, in water, um, but not heavy metal sensors that I can think of. Yeah, that'd be great if you could develop. The pro some of the issues are they're just in such low concentrations. You're talking parts per billion. And so being able to detect that um, in a flowing system and then looking for that chemistry, yeah, that would be great if we could develop sensors for that. So the questions about spatial and temporal studies. So. We can look at water quality, like this is a case studies. I, I talked about a couple different case studies here about water quality. Well, you always have to be testing your water. You can't assume just because, uh, uh, well, our system is different. We, oh, I'm fine. We have to actually test, and we have to test throughout time because things change. So um, we can use seasonality, so wet and dry season, but also development. Things change with time. So by having it, the distribution of an area and temporal and constantly monitoring, we will know better. We have to keep these up. We can't just assume that a study has been done somewhere in Malaysia and it counts for everybody in the whole country. You really need to do local studies in order to be able to understand. So in the United States, one of the, most of my students go into this, this field and they, they do those temporal and spatial studies for, for companies, for cities, for municipalities, for the federal government. It's their main job. So for their job, what they're doing is they're doing these studies constantly to make sure that the environment is clean. So these type of studies are really important because once you do it once, 
you, you can't stop because if you stop, something could happen in there. So um, in the United States, this is a great profession to go into. And I would love to see that this types of jobs, especially for looking at um, hydrogeology, becomes a profession around the world, um, that everybody is monitoring groundwater. Because as we have climate change right now, we're already starting to see it in places where, oh, we have so much water, why should we worry about using groundwater? Well, groundwater is that bank. Well, we're using surface water to drink right now. Well, we have all that water below the ground. Well, when we start, don't have any more water on the surface, well, let's just pump up all the water from the ground. Well, that's gonna go away too. And so if we don't know what type of resources, where we should be pumping, you could be like that one study where we're, we're looking at the arsenic water, where the people are like, you can't drink this water. You can never drink this water because it's so high in arsenic. But until you study it and you test it, you would never know not to drink this water from this area. Because it has yeah, arsenic into it. So you have to be constantly, and know that like, don't drink the water that's here. Maybe the shallow water is here. So we always have to be looking at those issues. Thank you so much, Doctor, for your insightful uh, sharing of the water quality in Southeast Asia and for this meaningful discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of our program, but before that, it's about time for us to invite our program director, Dr. Mohammad Suhaimi, to come forward and present a token of appreciation to Dr. Melissa on behalf of the School of Electrical Engineering, YTM Pulau Pinang Branch. All right, Dr. Melissa. So ladies and gentlemen, please give a big round of applause. You're welcome. Right. Thank you. So thank you, Dr. Muhammad Suhaimi, for presenting this token to Dr. Melissa. We sincerely appreciate you for your expertise and insights. Ladies and gentlemen, with that, we have come to the end of today's program on fostering global change, the Fulbright experience, and water quality issues in Southeast Asia with Professor Dr. Melissa. And now we would like to express our heartfelt thanks to you and we hope that the information and discussions today have been beneficial to you. And one reminder to UITM Pulau Pinang branch students, please remember to scan the QR code that will be displayed soon on the screen for your activity log. And for the students who are here, please scan the QR code that we found on the pink paper, as well as the blue paper for UITM staff who are here in this Hall. We would like to apologize if there were any mistakes throughout the event and please stay put. We're going to take a group picture at the end of today's program. With that, have a nice day. Wabilahi taufiq wa hidayah. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, everybody.